Okay, we're in part two here of the cost structure of the firm. I'm trying to keep these around 10 minutes or so, and so you can take a break, go to the restroom, get a cup of coffee, get a cup of tea, because that's the idea. We don't want to rush it too much here, but we want to just take it in small bite-sized pieces. So the last time we talked about what do we mean by the term fixed cost, and what do we mean by the term variable cost, and the key point there was fixed or variable compared to what? Compared to output. Output is a very big deal, as we saw before. Prior to this section of the course, we had price on this axis, quantity on this axis, we had our demand curve, we had our supply curve, and we're talking about what's going to happen to equilibrium price and quantity, all those sorts of things. Um, now we're going to change this, as we mentioned before. We're going to get rid of price here, which was in dollars, and we're just going to put dollars there again because we're going to be putting cost in here, not the price of the good, but the cost of the raw materials. So we're going to get rid of our demand curve and our supply curve. And we left off last time saying, okay, we have a fixed cost. A fixed cost that is what we call a flatliner. It just stays the same no matter what output. The next concept has to do with something called average fixed costs, where we take the cost and we divide it by the amount of units that we produce. Let's, let's just take a hypothetical example here. Let's say that we have to build some tooling for some military project. We're a defense contractor. And they want us to build a special small handheld device made out of some special sort of alloy. But we need special tooling for that. And let's, nice round number here. Let's just say the tooling costs $100,000. Now notice, we've got to spend that $100,000 whether we build 10 20, 100, 2,000, 10,000. We have to spend that amount of money just to make the first one. So when we spend that amount of money, well, let me just drop back a second. We make some samples just to see if they take them, uh, they use them, and they say we're going to go into production run based upon whether these samples really work out well or not. So we make a couple samples, and we send it off to the general, the admiral, or something, and they put it through its paces, and they say, yeah, that's, that, that's good stuff. We like that. Make 100, 200 of those. And so we start gearing up our assembly line and calling in our labor and, and putting this into motion. And just about the time we're ready to get going, we get another call from the admiral. The admiral says, oh, uh, just got back from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they decided that Rather than go in this particular project direction, we're going to go in that particular project direction. And so I guess we're not going to need your product after all. So tell you what, you just bill us for the cost of these, let's say they're alloyed wrenches of some sort that we spent $100,000 to fix. You just send us whatever the cost of building those samples were, and we'll call it good. And we'll put you in the running for the next round of contract bidding. Okay, let's say that we used our own labor, which we're not going to put in the mix, and we had raw material that we had laying around, so that really didn't cost us anything either. The only thing that really cost us a lot of money was this fixed cost, or this tooling. So we would take, we could take, well, how many did we produce? Let's say we produced four. One, two, three, four. So our quantity is four. So we take our cost of $100,000. That would be our fixed cost. And we divide it by the quantity we produced, which was four. That would be our quantity. Average fixed cost is that formula, fixed cost divided by quantity. That's what we mean by average fixed cost. So on the average, what did it cost us to get to produce these four units? Well, I don't have my calculator here, but I think I could come close to say, hmm, they're going to be like $25,000 a piece. 
So we send in our bill to the government. We said, we made four wrenches for you, and they're $25,000 apiece. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you could get something close to that. Wrenches are not supposed to cost $25,000 apiece. But as a matter of fact, was that the real cost? Even though we don't have any labor in there, we don't have any raw material in there, but yeah, we've got this fixed cost that we had to build all this tooling to get ready to produce this unit. And so we would send them a bill for four of these wrenches at $25,000. So let's say that we're over here. I'm going to leave this here for a second. Uh, I should put the formula here. Uh, average fixed cost equals fixed cost divided by quantity. And if we were to plot that, we'll let's say this is 10, 20, 30, 40, because we are planning on building at least a couple hundred of these, and we'd be all the way up here that if we only made one of them, we would be way up here at $100,000. If we only made one sample here, if this was really only one, if we only made one unit, they said, bill us for it. Well, then we would bill them for $100,000. But what if we made two samples? Two samples. We're over here at two. Well, now we would bill them $50,000 for each of those two samples, and we're down here at $50,000. So we got one point here. We got another point here. Well, what if we made 10? of these units. Again, the fixed cost stays the same. We made 10, so 100,000 divided by 10, I think, is $10,000. So we're up here at 10, and we've got, oh, let's see, about, um, here's about 25 here, and so 10 would be right about in here someplace, right about, here, right about the fixed cost line right here, and so 10, we're right here. What if we produced 100 of these units. Well, now it's going to come all the way down to $1,000, which is all the way 100 to be clear out here. we be right here. So what I'm pointing out here is if we connect the dots, and I learned this in kindergarten, dot to dot. Connecting the dots, we go from this dot. If I can draw, oops, see if I can do this very well. We have an extreme, ugh, that looks kind of ugly. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I can fix this for you, class, here, so I'm just going to kind of wing it here. Um, we have a curve that falls extremely fast, extremely fast, as we begin to produce the first few units. But as we continue to produce units, it hits this knee here, and it flattens out, and it gets flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter. It's always going down, because as this number gets bigger, right? and bigger, and bigger, and if we produced 100,000 of them, we could get it down to a dollar a piece for our average fixed cost. And as this number gets bigger and bigger, how long does it take until we get to zero? And the answer is, well, you, you can make this number as big as you want, and you're never going to get to zero, which means that this average fixed cost is getting closer and closer and closer to zero, but it never quite gets there. Now, this curve... Notice this is the fixed cost curve, but if we take the fixed cost and divide it by the quantity that we produce down here on this axis here, we get a curve that starts very, very high, just drops like a stone, hits this knee, and begins to flatten out very quickly. That is the major point of the average fixed cost curve. When we first begin a business, the riskiest part of that business from a cost perspective is your average fixed cost. Let me pause a second. Where we're going with this is that someone's going to ask you, well, you're going this business, what is it going to produce you to, what is it going to cost you to produce your output? And the answer is, just to make a long story short, there is no one right answer to that question. The answer to that question is going to depend on output. Now, that's a theme we're going to come back to again 
and again. And it has a relationship to cost accounting, etc. But for all business students, you have to know that that is a very loaded question. What does it cost to produce this unit? And the answer is it depends on the output. Either the forecasted output or the actual output is going to determine the cost per unit of our good. And the first kind of cost is our fixed cost. We divide by our quantity, we get our average fixed cost. Once upon a time, um, this curve, I, I, was, I, was, I felt like I was on this curve. Um, let me tell you this story about why this is such an adrenaline pumping area of the curve. And if you want to get a loan or you want any investment capital for your project, the first thing those people are going to want to know before they put any of their money into it is how are you going to get off this portion of the average fixed cost curve? Short story. I was in college. Um, I was getting wisdom because I was going to college. After all, that's what you go to college for, to get wisdom. And it was getting kind of painful because I had this thing called wisdom teeth. And they were not growing right. They were going in the wrong direction, causing me a lot of problems. But my, fortunately, my older sister was a nurse in Chicago, and she was working for an orthopedic, orthopedic orthodontic surgeon, I guess, dental orthodontic surgeon. And he said, well, I like you. And so as a Christmas present to you, because you really care for your brother, why don't you just fly him up here to Chicago, and we'll just pull those things out, and Merry Christmas to you as a gift to my sister. Quite a Christmas present. So, because they were so deep and they were so impacted, I had to go under, and I can remember coming out of the anesthesia and all that sort of stuff, and my brother-in-law wanted to pick me up and take me home, and he says, have you ever been to Palos Park? Of course, at that point in time, I got all this gauze in my mouth and all this stuff impacted, and the doctor says, now I want you to go home, because it's on his nickel, so he doesn't want me in the hospital very long. So he says, I want you to go home, he said, I want you to sit in an easy chair, and I don't want you to do anything that exerts, that don't lift heavy objects, don't laugh real hard, don't go out running or jogging, just be very, very calm. I'm getting to the story here. That's the important part about this adrenaline part of the story right here. Just do something very calm. So my brother-in-law says, have you ever been to Palos Park? And I say, no, I've never been to Palos Park. Well, let's go to Palos Park. So we go out, and on top of his car, he has this toboggan, like that, that toboggan. And so we go to Palos Park, he parks in the parking lot, and this is during Christmas break, and so it's just absolutely packed. And they have this hill, and so we pull this toboggan to the top of this big, long, big, long hill over here. And everybody's standing up in line with their toboggans, waiting to get up to this guy at the front who has this little lever. When the lever goes down, they push the toboggan over, and it tends to go off into this concrete chute that goes in my mind, at least it goes almost straight down. The toboggan bends like this when you're going down, and you proceed to almost go into free fall as you come down this huh, iced, half-culvert sort of thing. By the time you're hitting 50, 60 miles an hour down here, it is a real adrenaline rush. By the time you're going 60-some, maybe 70 miles an hour, and you're down here just going straight, you go, ha. Huh. Now, this curve reminds me of my experience in Palos Park. Just in case you've got a question here, no, I didn't spring a leak. Everything was okay, but it was a real heartthrob. That experience is what entrepreneurs face when they start up a business. They take either their money or their family's money, and they put it at risk. And the name of the game is you have to get off this portion of the average fixed cost curve, or it's not going to be pretty at all. And the sooner you get off of that and get to this area, as we increase output down here, your average fixed cost is low, and it stays low, no matter how many units you produce. And that is one lesson we want. We want to get off that average fixed cost curve, that portion of the curve. And you might remember my Palos Park story to do that. Now, we've got average fixed cost here. Notice what we did. We took the fixed cost curve, this number right here, we divided it by the quantity, and we got a corresponding average fixed cost point down here. Let me try to do the same thing with average variable cost, if you've got that picture. So now we said that, again we put dollars on this axis, we put quantity on this axis, and we said that variable cost varies with output. 
quantity on this axis means output. And we said that the variable cost curve starts at zero and proceeds up at some fairly steady slope. And the variable cost curve is made up of two components, raw material and labor. And the more units we make, the higher the average, the higher the fixed the variable cost. Now, average variable cost equals variable cost divided by quantity. So we would take whatever dollar value goes right there, and we divide it by whatever quantity unit we have right here, and we're going to get average variable cost. So as we go through here, and I can't do it exactly the same the way I did with average fixed costs, and so you're going to have to just take my word for it here for a little bit, and let me just show you what all average variable cost curve looks like. If you've ever seen the Nike Swish logo, all average variable cost curves start high, they begin to go down, they bottom out, and then they go up. Oops, not AC, AVC. All average variable cost curves start fairly high, they proceed to go down, and then they taper off. At some point, they bottom out. And at some output, they begin to go back up again. Let me tell you a little story about this one. One of my first jobs was with uh, a firm, and, and an engineer friend of mine would come home after work. And uh, rather than uh, kick the dog or, or, or say bad words to the wife or something, to take out his frustration, he would go in his basement and he would make fishing lures, fly fishing lures. He, he got this business from his father. Now we're going to talk about how the, why this curve looks this way. So he had this foam material and he would had an arbor press and he would punch out forms that look something like this, like this, and he would tie rubber bands around it and fishing and maybe a feather or something like that and somewhere in there he would have a hook embedded in that thing, and here's where you hook the, the line to it, because his father was a fly fisherman. I don't know anything about fly fishing, but I know he made these sorts of things. He made them in different colors, and he made them look like different sorts of insects. So he'd go downstairs, and he would build these units. It was a very simple business. He put a little classified ad in Field and Stream magazine, send one dollar for a price sheet and a sample or something like that and with it came a, a sample and then he would go to the post office after work and he would collect envelopes the envelopes would have money in them with an address and then he would get a steady clientele of customers who would just repeat order and repeat order and so he'd just go to the that, that was his whole marketing strategy put us a, a classified ad in field street magazine and go to the post office and pick up envelopes with money in them, go downstairs after work, and produce these things, and kick them out. Now after a while, the business, and he inherited it from his father. His father really started the business, but he wanted to retire and didn't want to do it anymore, so this is what my friend did. Now when he started this business, it wasn't all that big, and so he needed his sons to help him. And so when he brought his young, uh, they weren't even teenagers yet, very small sons into work, uh, he learned a very important management lesson is that you never pay them, people that age, by the hour. You pay them by the output. And when he did that, he learned that pretty soon if, if he paid them by the output, they were more motivated to get things done. And he built up little fixtures to make them more efficient. So as he increased his output by having his sons work with him, his average variable cost went down. Why? Because there's a learning curve to everything. And as you learn to do something, you get better and better at it as you increase your experience with it. But after a while, there's an end to that. And, and you get about as good as you can possibly get. And after he'd run out of using his sons to help him produce these units, um, they said, well, we want to go play soccer. This was in the age before computer games, etc. We want to get outside and play, especially in springtime. So let us bring in some of our friends. And as they brought in some of his friends, all of a sudden his average variable cost, which is made up of labor, raw material, his average variable cost began to go up 
because you put that many kids in a room together after school and they would rather play than do anything else. And now we've got rubber band games going on and we've got all sorts of things happening because you've got a critical mass of too many young kids in one, in one small space there. So there's an optimum number of people. In a different section of the book, that's called the Law of Diminishing Marginal Labor Returns. Different section of the book, but it applies here. The same thing happened with raw material. When he first started, days of station wagons, he would go to Cleveland and he would fill up the station wagon. He would make that trip maybe every couple of months, maybe, uh, until he had run out. And then pretty soon, he was making more and more trips to Cleveland. And the firm up there says, where do you live? Mansfield, Ohio? Well, then we send a truck down to Columbus. Why don't you just pay us? Um, to, when we get off 71 to drive into Mansfield on Route 30, just pay us mileage to take it to your house and drop it off, and then that would just save you a trip. Now, when he did that, rather than spend his whole Saturday driving up there and driving all the way back down, his transportation costs and his cost of raw material began to go down. As he began to increase his business even more, they said, oh, by the way, you don't have to pay us mileage because now you have full pallet loads, and we don't charge for full pallet loads. And so his cost began to go down, and pretty soon it went down even further because he said, you're buying so much that now you get a quantity discount on the amount that you're buying. And so as he increased output, his average variable cost, now notice what I didn't say. As he increased output, his variable cost continues to go up. But his average variable cost first goes down, bottoms out, and then begins to go up. And as he increases and brings in more and more of this material, his cost of average cost of variable cost continues to go up because now he's used up all the space in his garage and he can't store anymore, and so he's got to store it outside, and so kids come home from school, and they poke their fingers through the styrofoam, and it gets wet, and it gets damages, and now the accountant says you're getting pretty big, and now you've got to have all this insurance, and besides, you've got to have air conditioning for your basement, which you didn't need before because you've got that many kids down there, you've got that much working going on, and by the way, there's all these forms and rules and regulations because you happen to be in a residential area, not a commercial area, and now you've got to move out into a more expensive, and now you've got rent, and all, all these other things, and this average variable cost begin to go up. Now, that was a just short story version as to why the average variable cost comes down at the beginning, it bottoms out, no matter whether we're talking about labor or raw material, and it begins to go back up as we increase output.